Okay, the last speaker, <laughs> almost the last speaker, but uh, we should hear later the, some, some summary, but thank you very much, Mike, Michael, for coming and telling us about the right space in song learning. Thank you. So thank you to, to Haim and, and uh, Dan and the other organizers for inviting me. It's my third or fourth time here, and it's just amazing every time. So thank you so much for, uh, for the opportunity to be here and to talk about our work. So our lab is interested in understanding how the brain generates and learns complex sequential behaviors like speech, uh, music, language, um, <clears throat> other behaviors that we humans tend to think are uniquely human. Um, all of these behaviors require the brain to generate a uh, complex, uh, uh, precise sequence of motor gestures. Uh, those gestures are not innate. They have to be learned by hours and hours of uh, practice, 10,000 10, hours, apparently, of practice in order to become experts at these behaviors. Um, and also, we tend to learn these behaviors by imitating others. Um, and uh, so, so it's, uh, it's quite a remarkable um, set of behaviors that, uh, that fall under this category of complex learned behaviors. Now, it turns out that uh, we can study these behaviors in the brain using a model organism, uh, the songbird. Uh, this is the uh, uh, zebra finch, the, the songbird that we study. Uh, songbirds produce a complex sequence of, uh, of, of sounds. So that's a, a typical zebra finch song. Uh, zebra finch, so zebra finch song has a wide range of time scales. Uh, they have a song motif that they repeat over and over again that you could hear in that example. Each motif lasts about a second uh, and is composed of about four to seven individual song syllables that each last about uh, 100 uh, milliseconds or so. So songbirds um, learn these vocalizations by listening to their parents, much the way humans learn to speak by listening to others. They go through an early sensory stage in which they listen uh, to uh, the, the parent or some other adult sing. Uh, this is the juvenile bird here with the uh, adult male behind. Uh, then they go through a, a stage in which they begin to babble. They listen to themselves sing and gradually converge um, to what can be a very good copy of their uh, tutor song or their parent's song. So this is what that song progression looks like. Uh, so uh, this uh, young bird heard the tutor song, which sounds like this. Uh, at about the time the bird hears the tutor song, he begins to babble. So that's what the baby bird sounds like. And then over the course of just a few days to uh, a few weeks, uh, that babbling converges toward the adult, uh, the adult song of this bird. So some slightly more advanced babbling. You start to hear some repeated structure in the song. And then a few weeks later, the young bird sounds like that, which is a pretty good copy of the adult tutor. So how does this all happen in the songbird brain? That's what we're interested uh, in addressing. At, at a kind of a reverse engineering level, we really want to write down neural circuits that implement uh, this function. So the, the basic framework in which people think about how songbirds learn the song was uh, introduced by Kenji Doya and Terry Sinowski in the, in the late 80s. And, and the basic model is uh, a, a simple reinforcement learning picture. So uh, there's some part of the brain that produces the song. The bird sings initially some kind of uh, poor copy of the, uh, of the song. Uh, there has to be some variability because reinforcement learning requires that the animal explore different vocalizations to see what sounds best. Uh, the bird has, wow, that's bad. Is that back? Okay, I think I have a slightly flaky connector. Okay, so uh, the bird has a, a stored memory somewhere in auditory cortex that the, uh, as the bird listens to his own song, uh, he compares that self song with the memorized song of the tutor. Uh, there's some feedback signal, some error signal or a reinforcement signal that goes back to the song system and maybe the variability generator. And then over the course of time, uh, that uh, poor match gradually converges toward a good match to the tutor song, and the error uh, signal uh, gradually reduces to zero. So that's the basic picture. And then what I'll talk to you today is about um, the various uh, ways in which this basic framework is implemented in neural circuitry and how 
and, and some of the insights that we've gained uh, that are hopefully more generally applicable to uh, how the brain uh, works in general. So here's the basic outline of what I'll talk about today. I'll describe uh, neural sequences underlying song production. Uh, the song is, is represented at, in, in a part of the brain by a very sparse sequence of bursts that essentially forms the state space of the, uh, of the behavior. Uh, I'll describe a neural implementation of reinforcement learning in which the song is learned essentially independently by a reinforcement signal in each state uh, of the, uh, each temporal state of the song. I'll describe how that state space emerges early in song learning prior to the beginning of this uh, implementation of this reinforcement learning process. Uh, and uh, and um, so let's start with uh, neural sequences underlying song production. So song is produced by a, a set of brain areas called the motor pathway. The vocal organ is down here. It has about six muscles in it that are controlled by uh, a group of 3,000 or so motor neurons in the brain stem, just like motor neurons in our spinal cord. Those motor neurons get input from a uh, series of nuclei in the, uh, in the equivalent, in the analog, in the bird of mammalian neocortex. So this is the bird's cortex right here. Uh, there's essentially a feed-forward pathway uh, that generates the song, but there are some additional complexities, including a feedback loop that I'll touch on briefly in my talk. Our basic strategy in the lab is to uh, uh, think about how these circuits might work to go record from neurons in these brain areas, formulate hypotheses, and then uh, go uh, check those hypotheses in the data and, and try to refine how we think that works. We develop very small devices that we can implant on the bird's head to record from neurons, to manipulate neurons, and so on. This is a little motorized microdrive that allows us to uh, uh, advance electrodes into the brain, record from neurons without having to handle the bird. So I'll show you here some recordings from this part of the avian motor cortex. It sort of corresponds to layer five uh, uh, neurons in, in our uh, motor cortex. These neurons. Uh, generate patterns of bursts during singing. Uh, you can see that each time the bird sings, there's each time the bird s repeats its song motif, there's a very precise pattern of bursts that these neurons generate. Uh, each time the bird sings, that pattern is very precisely reproduced. And each neuron generates a quite distinct uh, pattern of bursts uh, during the singing. Remember, these bursts are now reaching down and activating motor neurons that directly innervate muscles of the vocal organ. Now I'm going to show you recordings from one step upstream uh, in this area called HVC. HVC neurons uh, are the site of this very sparse temporal coding that I mentioned earlier. These neurons generate, uh, this, is a, a, uh, this is the uh, electrical signal from an electrode placed near one of these RA projecting HVC neurons. These neurons generate a single burst of spikes during each repetition of the song motif, and those bursts are very brief. Uh, about five to 10 millisecond bursts of spikes, uh, about four to six bursts during each spike. If you record from a large number of those, if you record from a bunch of those neurons in, in, uh, in a singing bird and line up the activity to each other using the song as a temporal marker, you can see that these neurons, again, each burst once during the song and different neurons burst at different times during the song. If you record from a much larger number of these neurons, you can see that uh, the activity of these neurons as a population completely fills time. So there's a complete representation of time uh, of the song with a temporal, temporal resolution, again, of about five milliseconds. So these uh, recordings in the motor system led us to a very simple hypothesis for how this circuit works. Um, so the idea is that these neurons in HVC fire sequentially. Uh, again, t t I've drawn this tiled. We don't think they're really tiled, but it's easier to show this way in the in the diagram. So these neurons essentially represent each moment in time in the song. What do they do? What we think they do is at each moment, they activate downstream a population of these neurons in this nucleus RA that then converge to motor neurons in the brainstem and produce some spatiotemporal pattern of activity, of tension in those eight muscles of the vocal organ that then produce the song. Uh, so there are a number of different hypotheses for how you might get a sequence like this. Our favorite hypothesis is that these neurons essentially form a chain uh, where 
whereby these neurons activate, those neurons activate, those neurons again with about a five uh, millisecond latency, and that uh, activity propagates through that chain to form this representation of time in the song. We don't actually think that there is one continuous chain through the song that produces uh, the, the entire uh, song motif. There is some evidence from work in a number of labs that each syllable, each hundred millisecond syllable, is produced by uh, a chain connected within HVC, uh, and that the end of one chain reactivates the next chain through this feedback loop through the thalamus uh, and back to HVC. So the idea is that each syllable is represented by a little module in HVC that, uh, that through which activity propagates and sort of ballistically generates uh, one song syllable. Now you can see that in order for this to produce the correct song, I want to just briefly mention that the score of the song, this is a state space. That tells you where you are, what state you're in at each time in the song. But the emission from that state is really controlled by the pattern of synaptic weights from these HVC neurons onto the RA neurons. So when the bird learns its song, it has to learn first to generate this sequence, and second, how to map that time in the sequence onto activity downstream in the motor pathway. And I'm going to talk about both of those processes. OK, uh, we, we really like this hypothesis that there's a chain in HVC. Uh, there are other hypotheses where we've uh, uh, set out to directly test the existence of those chains in a collaboration with Winfred Denk and Jurgen Kornfeld at the Max Planck Institute, Ren Jane at Google, and Michael Long at NYU. The idea is to record activity from these neurons uh, using calcium imaging and then use uh, block face serial uh, uh, sectioning of uh, a piece of HVC and then do complete dense reconstruction uh, with Varenne's group uh, of the circuitry and look directly for evidence of this chain-like connectivity. OK, so uh, now let's say that we have a chain in HVC. How would we actually implement reinforcement learning in this circuit? So it turns out there's a completely separate circuit in the songbird that implements reinforcement learning. Uh, if you take an adult bird, you can lesion any of these brain areas, and the bird sings just fine. So this is a sufficient circuit to generate the song. But if you lesion these areas in a young bird, the bird can't learn its song anymore and has a number of very interesting specific deficits that allow us to figure out what's actually happening in this circuit. So uh, lesions of the circuit. Uh, 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 cause a, a deficit in learning. This was shown by Sarah Botcher and Constance Scharf and others, and led Sarah Botcher to propose uh, that there's actually a signal that is transmitted from this LMAN circuit to the motor pathway that programs up the motor pathway in how to produce the correct song. Uh, David uh, Perkel and, and others have uh, produced very compelling evidence that this circuit is actually highly homologous to the basal ganglia in mammals. Uh, uh, there's a cortical to basal ganglia to thalamocortical feedback loop here that's very similar in, in, in many, many ways, including all of the cell types in these areas, uh, very similar to, to basal ganglia circuits in mammals. OK, so how does this thing work? The first thing I want to tell you about is the hypothesis that, uh, that LMAN, this, this, cortic this other cortical input to RA, is actually a variability generator. We think it's a dedicated circuit that generates variability for the purpose of learning song vocalizations. I'm going to show you a few pieces of evidence for that. So uh, one thing we can do is we can look at the song of a young bird. This is close to the subsong stage. We can inactivate or lesion LMAN. And what you find is that all of that beautiful exploratory variability that the young bird is going through completely disappears, and the bird just goes wah, 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 like that. Okay. All right, so what is LMAN doing? One of the things we think LMAN does is it generates bursts of activity at the onset of each one of these subsong syllables that activates one of these babbling syllables. Uh, uh, in this very young stage. Uh, in, in very young birds, the, the duration of these syllables is actually exponentially distributed. So this is a very highly uh, random vocalization. So uh, this uh, variability generator also does other things. It generates variability throughout the learning process. Let me show you what that looks like. If we take a young bird at, at a stage where he actually has a syllable, 
after you inactivate LMAN with Musimol, for example, you can see that that variability goes away. Here are the pitch trajectories of a harmonic stack. Sorry, that's the harmonic stack a spectrogram before and after inactivation of LMAN. And if you look at the pitch trajectories, before LMAN is inactivated in gray, you see there's a lot of variability. And after inactivation, uh, the pitch trajectories become very stable. So, okay, so we have a variability generator. Um, how does the bird actually um, learn? So it turns out that Sarah Botcher was right. There is an instructive signal that's transmitted from LMAN to the motor pathway. Uh, even though the, the first thing that was discovered was that this circuit generates variability, uh, it took a little bit more effort to discover the nature of this instructive signal. Uh, this was uh, work uh, from uh, Michael Brainerd's lab and our lab that, uh, that showed evidence for this. So, um, so one of the, the way that we set about to do this is we uh, recorded the song in a young bird, measured online the pitch trajectory of one of these harmonic stacks. Here it is right here. If the pitch trajectory goes above some threshold, we play a noise burst to the bird. Okay, if the pitch trajectory stays below that threshold, sorry, there's the threshold. If the pitch trajectory stays below, we don't play a noise burst. Okay, so what, what do you expect might happen here? You might think that the bird starts lowering the pitch of its syllables to avoid that threshold, and you place the threshold, by the way, in the middle of the distribution of pitch, uh, pitches so that about half the time he, hits, he gets that noise burst. And sure enough, over the course of a few hours, what you find is that the pitch uh, drops um, each dot is the average pitch of one syllable that the bird sings over this uh, uh, day of singing. And if you look at the pitch trajectories over uh, in these separate um, windows in time separated by two hours, you can see that the pitch trajectories lower until he very rarely hits that pitch threshold. Now, where is that pitch change coming from? Something has to be, something, some part of the circuit is using this auditory feedback and learning to change the song to reduce errors. So how does that actually happen? Well, it turns out uh, that that change in pitch is being produced by biased variability that's being generated by LMAN. In other words, the variability that LMAN generates is being biased in a direction that reduces errors. Okay, and the way we showed that, uh, this is work uh, by uh, Aaron Andelman when he was a graduate student in the lab. Uh, if you drive learning using these uh, noise bursts, uh, whenever the, the pitch, again, is above this threshold, you play a noise burst, the pitch drops over time. When you inactivate LMAN, what you see is that not only does the, is the variability reduced, but the learned change also goes away. Okay. So again, that variability is being shifted in a direction of improved outcome. And so I'm not going to show you all uh, the, the other evidence for this, but the basic idea is that if there's a, a trajectory in motor space, uh, the, the motor system produces some trajectory. We're looking at, a, at the value of that trajectory in, in a particular 2D plane of the motor parameter space. LMAN injects variability, so each time uh, the tra trajectory gets to that point in time, it's a little bit different. But in the presence of an error gradient where the, where motor commands in this direction produce less error, you can see that, um, that the song becomes biased. The, the, the circuit shifts the bias, the, shifts the variability in the direction of lower, uh, lower error. Uh, and what happens is what we found is that the next day, the motor system has actually changed in the direction of the bias the previous day. Okay? And so the idea is that the, the anterior forebrain pathway is learning the gradient. It's learning which way to make the song better, and that drives plasticity in the motor pathway. Uh, it's sort of the motor pathway gets dragged along in the direction of improved performance. Okay, so now we can frame the question, how does, the bur how does that system learn that gradient? Okay, and, uh, and so I'm going to uh, tell you about our current favorite hypothesis for how that happens. So the idea is this. The, the song motor system produces whatever its current best version of the song is. LMAN injects variability by generating bursts of activity that produce uh, node fluctuations in, the, uh, in this network. And what happens is every axon 
that's going from LMAN to the motor system sends a copy, sends a collateral to this basal ganglia circuit area X. So area X is getting an image, a complete image of every command that LMAN is sending to the motor system to drive variations, okay? So if only area X had information about which one of those variations led to a better outcome or a worse outcome, it could figure out which variations to reproduce, to make happen more often. So, um, okay, so does area X receive an evaluation signal? So uh, we hypothesized early on that, that there may be a brain area, in, in, in particular we thought that the dopaminergic uh, system might be a good candidate for this. Uh, VTA, uh, a component of the dopaminergic system, sends a large projection to area X, and we wanted to ask, uh, uh, whether this uh, area gets um, a signal related to vocal performance. So, uh, so there have been a number of papers that support this view. Uh, Georg Keller and Richard Hanloser found error-related signals um, in, a, in a part of the auditory system that is part of a pathway that goes from auditory system down to VTA to area X. Uh, our lab uh, with... Uh, uh, Yael Mandelblatt Surf and Leora Loss and, and Natalia Denisenko uh, showed that this uh, layer five uh, component of the auditory system uh, that projects to VTA actually has error related signals in it. And then the, the, the real um, demonst clear demonstration of this was, uh, uh, <coughs> was done in, uh, by Vikram Gadakar and Jesse Goldberg's lab. So, what, uh, what Vikram did was he recorded anti from antidromically identified neurons in VTA that project to area X um, and, uh, and played noise bursts to the bird 50% of the time during singing while recording one of these uh, antidromically identified neurons. And what he found is that when he played a noise burst, these VTA neurons generate a little pause and when he didn't play a noise burst at the time that he usually played a noise burst, those neurons gave a few extra spikes. And so what you can see is that these neurons actually carry information about uh, whether the song performance was better or worse than recent past performance. They, it's, a, it's essentially a performance prediction error signal, very much like the kinds of uh, reward prediction error signals that Wolfram Schultz described in VTA of, uh, of the primate, okay? But this is now, um, the hypothesis here is that this signals the self-performance of the animal, right? That it signals whether the animal itself sang better or worse than its own recent past performance. So it doesn't depend on an external reward. That's the hypothesis. Okay, so let me put all of these things together for you into a simple hypothesis for how this whole system implements reinforcement learning. So the idea is that um, the idea is that the HVC and RA and motor neurons form a motor pathway. HVC neurons are firing sequentially, generating some output. Then the idea is that this this circuit, this variability generator, is injecting variations into RA that produces fluctuations in the song. Area X receives a, a copy, an efference copy, or a collateral discharge of that, uh, of that noise signal. And it also receives a signal that indicates how good or bad that, that fluctuation was. So now area X can, can simply carry out a correlation which variations led to a better outcome. Now the problem is that a particular variation at one time in the song might make the song better, but at a different time in the song might make the song worse. So this correlation here has to be done independently at every time in the song. So it turns out that there's a projection from the timing circuit to area X that carries a timing signal that's very much, it's a sparse representation of time, just like the timing signal that's sent from HVC to RA. So now, area X can figure out which variation at which time makes the song better, okay? And once it has that information, it can now take that timing signal and through this feedback loop through the thalamus back to LMAN, reactivate precisely the variations that in the past made the song better, okay? Now, the idea is that LMAN is generating biased variability, which means it's pushing the motor system in the right direction, 
And now a very simple Hebbian learning rule can, can build that, that bias into the projections from HVC to RA. Does that make sense? So we've implemented a very uh, uh, specific circuit level uh, implementation of this uh, learning rule. Uh, it, uh, it, it works very well. It describes a number of unique features of the learning process, including the temporal precision of that learning that I, that I described to you. Uh, it, it incorporates a number of interesting features, at, even at the synaptic level, namely that it's the synapses from HVC to RA that are learned during this reinforcement learning process. The synapse from LMAN to the to area X to these medium spiny neurons aren't plastic. They simply tell this uh, neuron when its part of the motor system uh, generated a piece of variability. And so uh, it turns out that uh, we've done connectomic reconstruction of these axons into area X, and it turns out that these synapses land on the spines of these medium spiny neurons, and these synapses land on the shafts of the medium spiny neurons, suggesting that there's an interesting heterogeneity in the microcircuit uh, consistent with how these different inputs interact in the, uh, in the basal ganglia to drive learning. Okay, so let me turn now to the question of how new sequences emerge. Now, you, you can see that in this model of how reinforcement learning is implemented, every part of this process, from producing the song to, to carrying out these uh, measurements of correlation between variability and, uh, and uh, vocal performance, require the existence of this state-space model of the song, right? of this sparse representation of time. So none of this even gets off the ground until you have a sparse sequence in HVC, okay? So the key next question we wanted to ask is how does that sequence in HVC emerge early in development, okay? Okay, so that's the next topic. Uh, so let me just remind you again that the bird goes through these stages of subsong production protosyllable stage in which the bird begins to produce a single uh, syllable of a characteristic 100 millisecond time scale. Then you have these different uh, kinds of syllables beginning to emerge, and then a few weeks later you have the, the crystallized, very precise song. And so we want to ask, how do these individual little sequences emerge to produce each one of these different syllables? Okay, so the job of the system early in this process is to develop a bunch of different chains bunch of different sequences. So uh, again, we're going to look into this by recording neurons uh, in HVC at different stages of this process. Let's start by recording neurons uh, in HVC that project to RA uh, early in this subsong stage, this babbling stage. What we find is that at this, and this was work done by Tatsukubo, a graduate student in the lab uh, at the time this work was done. So uh, Tots did these recordings of, of RA projecting HVC neurons during subsong, and he found that a lot of these neurons generate bursts of activity just prior to syllable onsets. So if we make a raster plot sorted by the duration of the syllables, you can see that this neuron generates a burst a few tens of milliseconds before the onset of, of almost all syllables. You can make a, a, a histogram of when different neurons were active prior to syllable onsets, and you can see that most of these neurons are active prior to the onset of subsung syllables. Now, what happens a little bit later as the bird starts? Um, so the first thing I want to point out is that there aren't really sequences here. These neurons are all sort of lined up at syllable onsets. Okay, so, we do, so the first message here is you don't really have sequences early on. They have to be built by the system. Okay, so now what happens? So now let's look at HVC neurons during this protosyllable stage where you start getting some of these rhythmic uh, short syllables. So Tots recorded a bunch of neurons in, in birds at this stage, and what he found is that these neurons are very tightly locked to protosyllables, but you can see the neurons are active at different times. So this neuron's active at the onset of the protosyllable, this neuron's active somewhere in the middle, and if you plot where those neurons are active, lined up to syllable onset, you can see that they already, at this point, form a sequence. But there's only one sequence in there, okay? So, uh, which is okay, because the bird's only singing one syllable. So how do we go from having one sequence 
to having a different sequence for each syllable that the bird needs to sing. So uh, let's take a look at what happens in HVC at this slightly later stage. Let me show you a little bit about how uh, syllables tend to emerge. So in, in many uh, young birds, you find that the bird has a protosyllable, and then a little bit later, this is just four days later, you can see that this protosyllable has two slightly different variants, a short one and a longer variant, longer, short, longer. And, and just two days after that, you can see very clearly the bird is alternating between two between two different new syllables, okay? So what's happening in HVC at this point? Well, what we find is that at this stage where you have two emerging syllables, you have a population of neurons in HVC that's specific to one of these syllables, a population that's specific to the other of these syllables, and a population of neurons that's active during both. So you have shared neurons and specific neurons. If you record a little bit later, what you find is that there are very few shared neurons, and almost all the neurons are now specific. And, uh, and then as an adult, you essentially have no shared neurons, okay? Now, this is consistent with a model in which we start with a single protosyllable chain, and then we start cutting cross connections down the middle of that chain, like we're splitting a ribbon down the middle. And you can see that there will be shared neurons at, uh, at the point at which the chains are not well separated, but you'll have specific neurons at the point where the dynamics is locked into being either propagating that way or propagating this way. And then gradually, as you finish cutting that, you'll have two completely different uh, chains. So we have a, a simple model for how this, uh, how this emerges uh, over the course of development, kind of putting all these different pieces together. Uh, I'm going to just uh, put out there for you a hypothesis for how this all actually emerges. So the idea is that LMAN generates bursts of activity that activate subsong syllables at the onset. So LMAN generates bursts that turn on subsong syllables. Remember, I told you about that feedback pathway that goes from RA back to HVC, and the idea is that that burst that turns on a subsong syllable activates a small population of neurons in HVC. Those are the onset-related neurons in HVC that I just showed you. Then the idea is that activating that population of what we call seed neurons in HVC causes the growth of a chain in HVC through a simple mechanism like the kind that Ila Feech proposed, combining spike timing dependent Hebbian plasticity with, a, uh, with synaptic competition implemented as a cap on the total amount of synaptic weight that a neuron can receive or transmit. And the combination of those two learning roles beautifully forms chains in networks that initially have random connectivity. Then the idea is, once you form this chain, you close that loop, and now you have a rhythmic oscillator, essentially, that generates a, 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 a protosyllable, turns around, and activates the next protosyllable, okay? Now, one chain, how do we go to having two chains? So the idea is very simple. You can, if you take this network, and you take that population of seed neurons, and you simply break it into two separate groups and activate those two groups of seed neurons alternately, it turns out that ILA's same learning rule that built this chain causes this chain to just split down the middle. And let me show you what that looks like. We've implemented that in a simple uh, MATLAB simulation. This was work done by Hannah Payne uh, when she was a, a student um, in the uh, methods and computational neuroscience course that I co-directed with uh, Mark Goldman for uh, a few years. So uh, you can see what happened. You started with a random connectivity. Your seed neurons came in and activated a small population of those neurons, and that chain just grew uh, from, from the seed neurons, and you can see the growth of that chain-like off-diagonal connectivity. Now let's take that population of seed neurons, split it into two, activate them alternately, and watch this. Still gives me chills down my spine to watch this. Okay, so we started with one chain. Simply activating those seed neurons in alternation uh, causes that network to just split into two. So we've seen evidence in the, in the uh, data, in the HVC data, that, uh, that you can have chain splitting into two daughter chains. And we, found that we have evidence that 
that one, of those, one or more of those daughter chains can actually split into two more chains, okay? And so now the idea is that each one of those chains is now one of these elements in, um, in the adult uh, motor system, okay? Okay, so, all right. Now, before the bird hears the tutor song, he doesn't know how many syllables he needs to sing, or even necessarily how long those syllables are. There's variability in how long zebra finch syllables can be and how many syllables birds uh, need to sing. So the bird can't, the young bird can't really form this state space until he knows what his tutor sounds like, right? So somehow this process of forming these chains in HVC has to be under the control of the auditory memory that the bird has of the tutor song. And this is the question that we're beginning to think about now. Uh, one of the hypotheses uh, that we're, we're very excited about is that it's really that tutor memory and auditory cortex that's involved in setting up or driving that splitting in HVC. The idea is very simple. Let's say the bird is exposed to a, a tutor song that has three different syllables. The idea is that somehow those three syllables drive the, the formation or splitting of three different uh, chains in HVC, one corresponding to each of the syllables in the tutor memory. Then uh, you have the auditory and motor system then interacting in a way that as the bird sings, it can read out the right part of the auditory memory to produce this uh, comparison. In other words, when he sings syllable A, he's Met, he's reading out the template of syllable A. When he's singing syllable B, he's reading out the template to syllable B, and then that allows this system to generate a performance signal that then goes to the reinforcement learning pathway. So there are very strong interactions between HVC and auditory cortex. Um, uh, Rich Mooney's lab has shown a, a number of these and, and demonstrated uh, uh, that they're important in the learning behavior. So auditory cortex projects to HVC, HVC projects back to auditory cortex in a way that's consistent with this idea. One of the other ideas that we're very excited about is that this process of, of auditory cortex shaping the structure of sequences in HVC uh, might happen during sleep. So Dan Margoliash discovered that the motor uh, system in the songbird reactivates song um, in a, during sleep in adult birds. Birds sort of dream about their song. But the really important observation is that this replay of activity during sleep doesn't start until after the birds actually heard the tutor song. So this is the amount of bursting activity during sleep as a function of days relative to the onset of training. So you can see there's zero bursting until the bird's exposed to the tutor song, and then all of a sudden you have all of this uh, sleep replay activity. So we're very interested in that. We're developing new techniques to be able to measure activity in auditory cortex and in HVC during sleep and during singing in very young birds. Uh, we've been beginning to do uh, functional imaging. Uh, we've started using the Enscopic system, but uh, we're also building our own very uh, small, lightweight uh, microscope for doing um, uh, functional imaging in HVC. Uh, the, uh, we express uh, GCAMP 6F in neurons in HVC uh, using a, a virus, and we get movies like this. So uh, we can extract uh, uh, a couple hundred neurons from these images using, uh, using uh, Liam Paninsky's uh, CNMFE method. Uh, you get a very large data set of activity of a lot of neurons. We've developed new techniques in collaboration with Mark Goldman for extracting sequential structure out of these high dimensional data sets. It's essentially a, a modification of the convolutional non-negative matrix factor factorization. We figured out how to regularize it in a way that, uh, that gives us essentially one consistent answer each time you run the algorithm. And so we're hoping to uh, begin to go and test sort of very specific implementations of this general idea of how the auditory system might uh, build uh, the state space for singing in HVC prior to the onset of reinforcement learning. Okay, so uh, 
there are a number of key points I want to just uh, reiterate. So the brain uses a, a sparse uh, sequence to represent the, uh, the state space of song during production. The basal ganglia has, a, uh, has an associated cortical circuit whose essential function is to generate variability important for vocal learning. Uh, and then the basal ganglia produce a bias in that variability to essentially point the system in the right direction, point the system down the gradient for improved, uh, for improved song performance. Uh, we see that uh, sequences emerge through a simple learning rule. Our, our hypothesis is that they emerge through a simple learning rule acting on, a, on a, an essentially initially random network, and that um, multiple sequences emerge by duplication of previously uh, learned sequences. And finally, uh, we, we hypothesize that that process of uh, new sequences emerging is driven by uh, activity by a replay of auditory memories in auditory cortex. And I'll stop there. I want to uh, thank these people for their contribution to the work that I presented today, uh, and thank you for your time. <laughs>